Welcome to Legacies, a journey through the interesting lives of elders. This program is brought to you by Cambridge Health Alliance and Somerville Media. Today, I'm very happy to have our guest, George Landers, who has, how long have you lived in Somerville? Forever? Well, people still say I'm a newcomer. I've been here since 1975. A year or two. Yeah, a couple of years. And so George has been really ingrained in the city, and we're going to talk about that. So George, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Uh, pleasure to have you. Now tell us a little bit about how you came here to this country. Well, I sort of jumped when you said uh, seniors, you know, a point, I, I forget I'm a senior. In, uh, in 1960, my father, my mother, and my eight siblings, we all got on an airplane and came from Ireland. And we moved to East Cambridge, uh, the 11 of us. And my parents liked it so much. My baby sister was born in 1961. So they ended up 10 of us. My dad was... Uh, he played music. Uh, he, been, he had been in a band since the 40s. He and his brother, Tommy, or Patty, he and Patty had a band, and he was just involved in music his whole life. When he came to the United States, he came out in 1959, and he took a job waiting tables, setting up and breaking down tables at the Commander Hotel in Cambridge. And he watched what the bands did. They'd play for a half hour, they'd take a break for a half hour. They'd play for a half hour, take a break. So he put that in the back of his head. So when he brought the family out, he continued playing music. And did, I what started, kind of music did he play? He played Irish music. Irish music. But he also had a big band. He had a 14-piece big band that played big band music from the, 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 uh, from the 40s. Glenn right. Miller, right. he did all of that music. So I grew up listening to all this old, old music. And that benefited me greatly later in my life. So in 1967, my dad asked me to play in the band with him. I was sort of, I could tell one side of a guitar from the other, but it took a long time for me to be comfortable on stage. So my dad moved back to Ireland in 1976, and I played in a band with my cousin Mike. And we did lots of weddings and stuff like that. We were booked years ahead of time. We played at the Fireman's Post at Florian Hall in oh, uh, Florian the Hall. Yeah, yeah. We were there Thursday, Friday, and Saturday nights. I was with them there for three years, but they were in the lounge there for eight years. Now, were you playing Irish music then, too? No, we played very <laughs> little Irish music yeah. then. Maybe one or two songs a night, or three or four, even though three guys in the band were from Ireland. But that's where the money was. That's where you went. Mm -hmm. uh, they retired. Two of the guys retired in 90. So I continued playing. I went back into the Irish music, basically. And I continued that till about uh, about seven years ago. So that was a long time, probably 45 years I was playing. Well, in the interim, though, you you were doing other things. You oh, did. yeah, the band was just a sideline. It was always a sideline. Um, I went to Ringe Tech in Cambridge, and I took cabinet making. Because my mom said when I was a baby, when I was a small child, they would give me a hammer and a nail and a piece of wood. And I would hit the nail into the wood and pull it out. And I would do that all day. That would keep me busy. I loved it. <laughs> I ended up becoming a carpenter. I was in the Carpenters Union, Local 40, over in Cambridge. And about 1984, the drummer in the band, who was also in Local 40, started his own business. Actually, it was about 1980. And I went to work with him, F&R Construction. And I worked with John till the year 2000. Doing carpentry? Carpentry, oh yeah. We worked at the Deaconess Hospital at the time. We were there for about 18 years. Wow. We did all of their projects that... Uh, That's enough to keep you busy. Hours. Oh yeah, we had so much fun. We did a lot of work. But uh, in the year 2000, I got a call from the mayor of Somerville, my buddy, Dorothy Kelly Gay. And Dorothy said to me, George, I have an opening. Would you be interested? That's when I started working with the city. What department was that? I was the rehab housing inspector in the Office of Housing and Community Development. It used to be OHCD. It's now known as SPCD, Strategic Planning and Community Development. I stayed there for about uh, four years. So just briefly, what does that department do? Uh, they facilitate HUD grants. Uh -huh. They give uh, eligible residents, and it was a lot of seniors, uh, you get 0% interest loans. 
sometimes up to $50,000, and you only pay them back when you sell the house. Wow. So if you kept the house, and there was no interest ever, and there was a heating program, these programs still go on in the city, uh, go down to the annex down on Evergreen. But um, then they had a heating program, which was up to $4,500. And it was a five-year forgivable loan. After five years, it went away. You didn't owe anybody any money. Great programs, and they're still available through the city of Somerville. Um, so I was asked in 2004 if I had my builder's license. I said, no, I never needed it. I always worked with somebody who had it. They said, get it. So when Mayor Curtitoni became mayor, I was appointed as a superintendent of inspectional services. And I spent the next five years there. And that's when you go in, you check buildings if they're not well, safe, that kind of thing? No, not quite. That's anything that's built in the city, including this place at Assembly Square, where they have to pull permits. Uh -huh. Building permits, electrical permits, plumbing permits. It all went through Inspection. inspectional services. So I was the superintendent, and we had... It's an amazing... The, uh, the, the smart people that we have working for this city. So, and again, this is a big thing for, for homeowners in this city. If you need something done, make sure that the contractor pulls a permit. What it does is it safeguards you because the inspectors will come out to make sure it's done right. Because you don't know if somebody's doing electrical work, if plumbing work, the inspector will come out to make sure it's done correctly. Right. And it's a great safeguard. Good. So for you, in your life, you got married. I got married in 1972. And when I told you I went to Rinch Tech in Cambridge, I met my wife in 1970. And about a year later, we're talking about getting married. She says, I'm not marrying you. You don't even have a high school diploma. I quit high school in my senior year because I was playing music five nights a week. Mm. I couldn't get up in the morning. Mm. So I went back to Rinch Tech full time and graduated when I was 21. Good for you. I was a 21-year-old high school graduate, and we got married the following <laughs> September at 72. So uh, my wife then, when all of our children were in school full-time. How many children do you have? Three children, uh, two boys and a girl. They're now 37, 38, and 39. But my wife, when the youngest was in school full-time, she went to nursing school and became a nurse when she was 40 years old. So you talk late about late bloomers, but that's oh, okay. late bloomers. It's never, never too, too late, late right? <laughs> it's never too late. So me doing the music, I had done music my whole life. I loved it, and I played at the mayor's picnic for many years, and I always wanted to play music for the seniors, but I really couldn't because I was working, and most of the events take place during the day. Right. You they're know, not they're late in the goers. morning, 10 o'clock in the morning and the 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I was still in work until 4 o'clock. So when I retired at 66, uh, a little over three years ago. Now, uh, what, what, brought, what, why did you retire? Um, I, had, I had a heart attack when I was 50. I was going to retire at 66 anyway. Oh. You know, I put that my That was your plan? In. That was my plan. But I, <laughs> I collapsed. And I now have a pacemaker, thanks to that collapsing. But uh, I'm the healthiest I've been in 30 or 40 years, I think. Interesting um, the way that works out. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I feel great. I don't even know this is here. I get it checked every six months, and they say, oh, look, you had an event at 2 o'clock in the morning on, on March 11th. And it's like, really? <laughs> they read the whole thing through a computer. Yeah. So after I retired, my intent was to golf and to play music for the seniors. Our youngest grandson was a micro preemie, our oldest, it was a micro preemie. He was one pound, three ounces. Mm -hmm. So he spent four months in the NICU and he was 129 days in the NICU and his first year he was on oxygen. So my wife spent five days a week taking care of him. So now, I was- she, Your wife was working my, and then- well, she yeah, left? she had planned on retiring, but I got to retire about two weeks before her <laughs> when they put the pacemaker in. My doctor said, I was going to retire in April, but this was February. My doctor says, you're not going back to work. So I recovered. But uh, Nico uh, 
we took care of Nico for the first year, my wife did. And then I started booking jobs for the seniors. And that's how I met Roberta a few, couple, only a few months ago. And uh, I absolutely love it. Uh, so tell us what you do for the seniors. You don't play guitar. Oh, no, I don't play guitar. I DJ. And uh, I can do big parties or small parties. I have a small little system that would completely fit in this chair. And I also have a much larger system for a bigger event. Some of the places I work, in fact, in, a few weeks ago, we did a pride flag raising. I've done two of them this month at senior buildings, at assisted livings. And it's magnificent. These were done outside. They were gorgeous days. So my familiarization with the music from my father and all of that old music from the 40s and 50s and me, my brother Mike, my late brother, who uh, he passed away at 61 because he never went to the doctor. Uh, by the time he went and was checked, it was too late. He had prostate cancer. He was a Vietnam vet, and we think that's the reason that it killed him. But the music, he had the biggest record collection I've ever seen. So I grew up in the same room with him, listening to all the old music. So my whole life has been listening to this old music. So my favorite thing to do is to sit with the seniors, and I play these songs, and I talk about the song. I talk about some of the history of the song, and because that's, that's been my life. And I just, I am having the best time I've had. Oh, I can't remember. So you have reinvented yourself several times now. Oh, yes, I, I have. <laughs> and there may be several more. Yeah. When Who I, knows? In fact, when I went back to high school at 21, taking cabinet making because I knew what I wanted to do, I built my wife's hope chest that she still has. I built that in my senior <laughs> year of high How school. How could she say no? How could she say no? It's all <laughs> cedar. That's where all of the good stuff goes. Now, when, you came, when I came in, you told me about your shirt. You want to yeah, share? this you shirt here, it says... Uh, Sun Record Company, um, Elvis Presley, Roy Orbison, the Sun Studios were so important to the early life of rock and roll because this is where Sam Phillips, this is where they did all of their recordings was at Sun Studios. So coming here with Roberta today to talk a little bit about music, I thought I'd put this shirt on. And when I went down to the kitchen after I got dressed, my wife says to me, what are you wearing when you go to show with Roberta? I said, this. <laughs> so I just thought it was an interesting little throw-in. Right. Well, you love the history, the history of the yeah, music. Yeah, the history the of history. the music is so important to me. Yeah. And uh, it's just, I play memory units also. And when you walk in the door and you try to have a conversation with some of the residents, and unfortunately, they can't carry on conversations with you anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's sad to see, but it's not sad when I start playing music and I'll have 50 people in a room and I'll play some of the old, like, Que Sera Sera by Doris Day. And the whole room is singing. Mm -hmm. It's like, it puts a light in there. Oh, it just lights them up. And for me, that's magic. It is magic, and you know, I've witnessed that because I was in a, uh, on a unit of uh, totally nonverbal Alzheimer patients, and, uh, and so they were not speaking. They weren't able to, and music played, and they sang every word, and they get up and they danced, and it, oh, yeah. was, it, was, it was magic. It was the most amazing experience for me. It was magic, and the, one of the facilities I do this at is out in Lexington, and I do it year after year, and it's also sad to see the demise of some of the people who go in there with early onset Alzheimer's, and you see them three, four, five, six years down the road, and it's, you know, even the music then for some of them right. doesn't, yeah, you know, it doesn't it. work. It just goes beyond it. Yeah. But while they're still there and able to enjoy it, it's, oh my God, I just, I get so much fun out of it. Well, music is a great spirit lifter. Oh, it's great. Don't you it's think? great. I absolutely love it. Yeah. And now I have three grandchildren, and the oldest is, it will be four next month. And I have two others, uh, Sam and Owen. Sam was three in January, and Owen just turned a year in uh, May. So you babysit? Oh, yeah, every Tuesday we'll have uh, the two youngest, and then we have Nico every Thursday, every Wednesday. 
He's over at the house today because they come over for a swim. Yeah. And what day is it, Granda? I said, it's Monday. He says, what am I doing here? <laughs> <laughs> he knows he comes on Wednesdays. It's just so much fun. We, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you know, life is it's beginning all over again for us. It's Isn't that magic. Wonderful? It's absolute magic. So it doesn't really matter. As, as we walk this highway of life, mm. you know, I hear a lot of people in their 50s and 60s say, I'm old. It's like, if you think you are, you are. Oh. Right? If you think you're old, you're old. But if you, if you stay young at heart, yeah. I think then life is magical for you. No, you know, that doesn't mean we don't have our pains and aches today. I mean, I worked... I need my, nef my left knee replaced. I have osteoarthritis in the left knee, but I get gel shots twice a year and it's, it's still working. I get to walk golf probably three or four days a week. I walk nine holes of golf, but I started working for the city at 50 and I worked hard my whole life. I worked construction and you know, you had your pains and aches at the end of the day. I haven't done physical labor like that in the last uh, almost 20 years now, but I'm in better shape now than I was 20 years ago. I just love what I'm doing. I, I love think where that's I the am. key. Don't you think that's yeah. the key? It is the key. And uh, what I like to live my life by is do the right thing. It's that simple for me at this time in my life. We all know what the right decision is. We all know what the right thing is that we should do. And I think as we're aging, you know, that can be a problem. But I think at my, right now in my life, I just try to do the right thing and not to intentionally hurt anybody anymore. All right. It's really easy. So I think that's great. And I, and I think that's a great lesson for the folks out there, right? That at it, it, any age, you can reinvent yourself. The idea is to find your passion yes. and to go with it at any age. I tell this to my grandchildren. You know, follow your heart. Do what you love to do. And then everything else falls into place. I mean, I have this wonderful rapport with Roberta. And it's hard to believe we only met a few months ago. Uh, my sister, her partner, who she'd been with, Butch, she'd been with him 30 years. And he passed away about three or four years ago. And she was living alone. Um, you know, life didn't play her a good hand. So we had to get her out of where she was living. So I, uh, I looked into certain things and that's how I found this woman. Cindy got in, my sister, got into the PACE program, which is facilitated by the Cambridge Health Alliance. Uh, and what's happened to my sister in the last five months is truly a miracle. She's living at uh, an assisted living in Somerville, and she's having the time of her life, and I owe an awful lot of that to this woman for heading me in the right direction, and, and it turns out my wife, who had worked uh, as the wellness director at Uville House Assisted Living over in Cambridge, was very familiar with Roberta because they had worked together for many years because Roberta also did her spiel uh, to try to help people at the uh, place my wife worked at. So it's, it's amazing how things happen. And this was totally out of the blue. And I can sit here with this woman and I feel like we've known each other forever. It's wonderful, and it does happen sometimes that way. And that's what keeps me doing what I do every day, because every day I am blessed to make a difference in someone's life, whether it's doing a presentation, whether it's doing an event, whether it's connecting people to resources, or helping people with the PACE program. Mm. So I hope you enjoyed this program today. I certainly had a good time, George. Oh, I'm, I'm available. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining Thank us. Thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. Mm -hmm.